Hello everyone and welcome to our cash flow strategies um, webinar today. Um, today we're going to be going through and talking about uh, I suppose this new world cash flow forecast that certainly is required at this point in time um, to assist us navigating um, this, this period with COVID-19. We're just waiting for a few more people to join and then we're going to kick off. And with me today, um, I have Matt Lamming. So my name is Tanya Tipman. Uh, I'll do a quick introduction while we're waiting for those people to come online. And uh, my name is Tanya Tipman. I am the National Lead for Financial Education with BDO. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with businesses and helping them to navigate and understand financial terminology, financial concepts, and actually putting tools in place in their business to, um, to help empower them and, and give them control over that whole financial management piece. And a large part of that is cash flow forecasting. It, it's one of those um, things that I think a lot of people struggle with. So we're going to take you through some really practical ways in which you can approach uh, cash flow forecasting and give you some tools that you can put in your toolkit uh, and, and hopefully uh, use those to extend your cash flow um, to last a little bit longer. I also have Matt Lamming with me here today. Uh, Matt is the National Lead for Business Services with BDO and I'll let Matt introduce himself. He certainly um, has a lot of experience uh, when it comes to real estate. So really excited to be presenting with Matt today. Good afternoon all and good afternoon Tanya and thank you uh, for for Tanya to, to be on board today. She brings a wealth of experience in terms of cash flow management. Um, as, as Tanya pointed out, um, most of you probably would be aware of, of myself in, in our dealings with uh, the real estate industry in South Australia and, and with RISA. Um, so yeah, definitely looking forward to, to sharing some things with, uh, with you all today. Thanks very much, Matt. So we're going to kick off. We've got quite a bit to cover. Um, so as we go through, if you do have any questions, um, I like to keep these sessions quite informal and uh, we will be recording the session. So anyone that hasn't been able to attend in person today will be sent uh, a copy of the, um, of the webinar. But if you do have questions, please put them in the question box, send them through to us as we go. And we'll address those questions um, as we go through the presentation rather than leave them to the end. So um, at the relevant points in time, um, we'd love to be getting those questions through from you and, uh, and answering them as we go. So feel free, there's no uh, silly questions that you can ask today and, um, and we're certainly here to, to help you navigate this piece. All right, so let's have a look at what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to talk about this new world cash flow forecast. So Forecasting at the moment is a little bit different perhaps to what you've experienced previously. Uh, and we, we refer to it as a new world cash flow forecast because uh, it's probably a little bit more granular um, and there's some different functionality that you really need to be able to understand the levers you can pull to extend your cash flow. Uh, we have a number of different strategies that we're going to talk through in terms of what's available to you. And we're looking at these from very much a, a specific um, approach for, um, for your industry. And Matt will be able to add a wealth of his knowledge uh, to that conversation. So we'll certainly be tag teaming as we go through these strategies today. Um, there's, there's a number of, of strategies. I also refer to them as levers. Um, and they are, they're really important to understand. So whilst it might seem like um, you know, it's hard to predict, uh, with a good plan and with the right pieces in place, you can actually get quite a, an accurate cash flow forecast. And you can also build in some what if type scenarios to see um, what the impact is if you were to put some of these strategies in place. And that's really, that's the tool that you need at the moment to be able to navigate because things are changing quite quickly. We're also going to touch on some of the uh, government and industry support that is available. There's an enormous amount of information out there. I think the most challenging part uh, with it is that um, trying to navigate all of that information and bring it all together and, and trying to work out what's relevant and what isn't. Um, and some of it is quite technical. So we'll try and demystify um, that for you today, specific to your industry. 
and uh, talk about a 90 day business rescue plan. So an approach that you can use to kind of bring all this together into a framework that, you know, is compartmentalized, builds it into a 90 day plan um, that gives you some, some actions that you can take now towards um, extending your cash flow further. We're also going to show you um, a cash flow tool that we've developed and, and way in which we can help support you to, to build this if, if you find that you actually don't have a robust cash flow process in place for your business. It's really a critical piece at this point in time for all businesses to have. Um, so we have built a model which is specific for, um, for the real estate industry and, and it really attacks this whole this whole area, brings all these pieces together um, in a simple tool that you can embed within your business. So we're going to take you through and uh, show you what that looks like and um, give you some pathways that you might like to um, look to build that for your business. So as I said, any questions as we go, please, uh, please put them into the um, chat box and we will address them on the fly. All right, so the first thing we're going to go through is uh, this whole cash flow forecast for the new world. What does it look like? What are the elements that we need? And why is it actually different um, to perhaps the way that you've approached cash flow forecasting in the past? Well, for many people, uh, I think cash flow forecasting is, is becoming a really critical thing, but we find that a lot of businesses don't actually have a cash flow in place they don't they haven't needed one um, it's not something that they've necessarily needed in the past or if they did they've potentially done it on a monthly basis um, and that's fine but what we need to know now is probably um, a little bit more regular things are changing very fast so to be able to have a model which allows you to do some forecasting um, to build in some what-if scenarios and to keep it quite granular in a a weekly forecasting template is really what's required. So it's it's getting down into a little bit more detail and building it out so that you can um, you can work with those pieces more readily. Matt, any any comments from you? Because I suppose you've worked with a lot of real estate agents, and in terms of you know the past experience and you know how they're having to adapt now into the future, what are you seeing at the moment? Yeah, look, I think um, you know as as we all know that the restrictions we've seen put on the the real estate industry in, in I suppose, the most recent months um, have have really locked things down, made it really difficult to um, to interact, made it really difficult to get those things through in terms of settlements and, and the like. Um, thank, thankfully, we've sort of seen some lifting of, of those restrictions in the past week, which probably brings some relief. But, um, you know, in the past, as you say, we've we've worked at a probably higher level in terms of cash flow on a month by month basis um, because we haven't had, I suppose, such drastic movement in cash flow throughout the month. You can you can better forecast that. But I guess with all these restrictions, um, with things moving so quickly in terms of JobKeeper and all those sorts of aspects, we've had to move back to a a day by day, a week by week approach so that we can fully understand what the next 90 days look like and what are the, the things that you need to push and pull to get through that 90 days with still a, an eye on the future and and thinking about the longer term. So, you know, I think it's a, a mixture of, of both that granular and high level approach is, is what we're seeing as best practice. Yep, awesome. Okay, so what we're looking at in terms of when we talk about a cash flow forecast, so if this is new territory for you, um, often there's a lot of a lot of confusion around, you know, profit versus cash flow. Um, and you know, what we're looking at in a cash flow forecast is modeling how how money moves in and out of the business. Um, and sometimes you've got you know multiple entities to deal with as well. So when we look at a cash flow, it doesn't really matter on um, so much the business unit, business entity. You can look at it from a consolidator point of view. You can also look at it from a, a um, individual business unit point of view. Uh, and that and that really depends on sort of how you're managing managing the group. But the elements of it is, is just understanding what your opening bank balance is, and that's something that gets updated on a weekly basis. The cash that's flowing in, and that can come through. Um, cash flowing in has a, a number of different elements in terms of timing. It could be cash that comes in on an automatic basis, so it's got a regular element to it, or it could be um, cash coming in that might be more of a variable basis, which is, you know, it's a little 
little bit less predictable. You don't know when that money is going to come in, so you've got less control over it. So breaking it down by these different elements is really important um, to be able to move and, and put some what if scenarios around. Cash going out is the same. There's, there's elements that will be fixed. So you might have some uh, direct debit set up. You might have loan repayments set. They're gonna come out on a set date on a regular basis. And then you've got the amounts that flow out, which are what I call of a variable basis. So you have the control and the choice as to when that money goes out. Um, and all of those elements leading together then comes up to your forecasted end balance. Um, each week then you need to reset your cash flow with the actual starting balance and reforecast out. And, and ideally you wanna have 12 weeks <coughs> Um, cash flow predicted and you can get that quite accurate. It's very much about how much effort you put into building it determines then how accurate um, it's going to be over the next 12 weeks but it's something that you need to touch and build on on a regular basis. Um, so breaking things down into those elements is really important and um, what I've got on screen here to show you is just an example um, in terms of what the ultimate um, end position is. So this is kind of showing you your opening balance the cash coming in in terms of all the various um, pieces from your recurring cash, your variable cash in. We've also factored in um, things like the JobKeeper subsidy and PAYG cash boost, which is an offset amount. But these are really, um, it's really complicated. And I'm sure many of you have gone through this process of trying to get your head around how the, the money, the timing of say JobKeeper subsidy coming in with wages going out and PAG withholding being withheld. It's really hard to, to work that through. But when you break it down into a weekly basis, um, you can start seeing it quite clearly and understand where the gaps in your cash flow is. Um, and so when it's all factored together, the forecasted balance at the bottom, red indicates that we've got a cash flow crisis, not enough cash flow. Green indicates that we have sufficient cash flow. So when we can start seeing this um, in this sort of overall picture like this, you can actually do things to move your cash flow around. And sometimes you're moving it just by one week to extend it out. Um, so if you've been in the habit of, um, I suppose, paying bills, bills come in, you pay them because you've always had cash flow to pay them, um, then you know perhaps now it, it's becoming a little bit more challenging because you've got to you've got to be a little bit more careful about conserving cash for what's coming up. And if you're trying to do that in your head, um, that is incredibly stressful and, and would consume a lot of mental energy. So trying to get it into a framework um, is really a key piece uh, for all businesses at the moment, but certainly um, for industries such as yours that have been you know, quite impacted, it, it becomes critical to get this piece in place. Matt, any comments in terms of um, you know, that overall process and bringing it all together? Yeah, I think the the key element um, is is the timing aspect, and and um, I suppose what what we've seen, you know, in recent weeks, um, and I think what we'll see going forward um, for the next few months is is just the timing of of things like settlements and when they'll fall. Um, you know, the the impacts of of credit and the banks um, delaying delaying settlements. So, you know, you originally thought that a settlement would land this week um, due to, to the banks not coming to the party or things like that. They, they get pushed a week and every time something gets pushed a week, it makes it harder and harder to, to have funds in the bank to pay the bills that need to happen. And, and then you've got to then manage, um, you know, the creditor side of things. Now, whether that's your, your advertising side of things um, and things like that, that, you know, ensure that the doors stay open um, but you know the probably the most critical one is is wages making sure there's enough funds there for wages and and I suppose these are the the mechanics that you have to get right to ensure that you know everyone's comfortable the business is comfortable and and this is a good good approach to to just having that on paper clearly so that you can make those decisions reasonably quickly yeah. And, and there's nothing worse than turning up, you know, at the start of the week and finding that you don't have sufficient cash flow. So if you've been living by the bank account and it's all been pretty good, um, you know, it, it's quite stressful to sort of turn up and find out that you don't have sufficient cash and now you've got to start planning. So, so just getting the data, understanding what the forecast looks like and then knowing the pieces that you can move around um, gives you a lot more uh, relief and, you know, the ability to to actually stretch the cash flow further. It's really an essential piece um, for all businesses 
to have in place. It always has been. It's just become more relevant now, I suppose, with um, with people having to manage cash flow a lot more carefully. Um, so, so we're going to go through that in a little bit more detail and and show you sort of the the process around how this works um, as we go through. But before we do that, um, we're going to talk about some cash flow levers. So. These are um, ways in which we can and we put them into two categories, uh, either increase the amount of cash coming in or decrease the amount of cash going out. Um, so how we're managing these elements and the impact that they'll have. And we break them down into things such as pricing volume, um, accounts receivable, and accounts receivable is a really big uh, piece at the moment. I know a lot of people are putting a lot of energy and effort into, you know, to, um, getting more structure around that part of their business because it's such a critical element of cash flow and, and certainly in your industry, that's um, that's a key one. And cash going out, we're looking at um, utilization of assets, we're looking at expenses, um, in looking at your commissions and also looking at your staff ratios. So just trying to conserve the amount of cash going out um, of the business and how you can maximize it and stretch it further. So we're gonna dive into each of these um, in a little bit more detail and I'll get Matt to um, take you through in, in terms of a really, uh, the application to your specific industry. So the first one we're gonna go through um, is the expenses lever. So looking at where we can cut costs, um, increase revenue and stretch our cash further. So Matt, would you like to um, take everyone through this in terms of the real estate um, element? Yeah, so I think you know uh, the key area here is is doing the line by line, and and um and it's it's definitely something that we've seen many of the businesses that we're working with go through that process. Um, so you know looking at at, at the areas through the PNL now whether that's sort of gifts or flowers for the office, those online subscriptions um, that sort of sit there, you know you've got to ask yourself what are those absolute core systems core elements in terms of the services you need to deliver to vendors and landlords. Um, things like, you know, the rent going back to to landlords and, and trying to negotiate um, uh, things around uh, that uh, in terms of, um, uh, yeah, the insurances aspects, um, looking at those elements. Um, but but it's that true uh, line by line, um, you know, photocopy, a paper, all those sorts of things. Do you need to have all of those costs in the business now, particularly given the environment we've had to work with? Um, you know, being able to do all your contracts digitally um, rather than using paper, that's going to save a, a bunch more costs. So it's working through that to reduce your, your costs down to what are the core pieces that you need to deliver your, your services um, and being as lean on that as possible. Yeah, and you know, one of the things, um, Matt, I'm sure you find it with a lot of the clients that you work through is, you know, often um, a line item in your P&L might have um, things hidden behind it. So I find subscriptions is a really great one that, you know, if, it might be a line item, but when you dig into it and you see the detail of the transactions within that line item, um, you find there's a whole lot of subscriptions that you've signed up to that um, perhaps you forgot about and, you know, they're things that you could cancel. Um, it's And these are the, you know, it, it starts to highlight some of the fat in a business. And I find every business that we go through this process with um, has has an element of it. I like to call them discretionary expenses. So um, I get people to create a category in their profit and loss for discretionary expenses. And what I mean by that is um, these are all the nice things to have. So when you get to a time like this where you've got to go lean, um, it's the first area you go to to cut back. So you know it's it's kind of the, the things that you do when times are great and it might be all of the, the various gifts and the um, you know the nice things that you do for your team but when when times get lean you've actually got to cut back and it gives you a bit of a uh, an area to focus on before you start doing things that might impact on strategy um, so every business has it I'd really encourage you as a first step to to really scrutinize and go through line by line your profit and loss 
um, and look behind the actual line item as well. So actually find out, you know, if something doesn't make sense, do a bit of, a de of detective work and look further to see whether, you know, there's some other elements there sitting behind it that, you know, you'd forgotten about or you signed up to a while ago and, and start working through and cutting all those back. So operating lean, which is, which is a great way for a business to operate anyway, um, but I would be surprised if you went through your p l that you, you wouldn't find some things in there that you could actually start cutting. Um, so that's the first one that we're going to go through. Um, the next one is in relation to um, looking at your pricing strategy. So a little bit a little bit more difficult um, perhaps in some instances but um, you know looking at the way in which you're delivering um, in terms of pricing um, looking at um, channels and products and services and you know the value that you're delivering so there's a whole range of um, strategies that you can bring into place in terms of pricing Matt do you want to just comment on on any of your thoughts around this one yeah, look, definitely. I've spoken many times about the importance of, of commission rate and management um, management fee percentages. Um, you know, if you can maintain your commission rate, maintain your average commission per sale, then that, that allows you to maintain margin. Now, you know, what we tend to find in, in sort of times of, of, you know, reduced listings and things like that is that those are the things that get discounted first. And I guess every time you discount in that area, be it the com rate or the management fee, what this means is you have to do more volume to maintain the same top line. And that's difficult in, in a, I suppose, a reduced market, um, which we, you know, we've seen in the last sort of six to seven weeks. Um, and and it's it's really challenging to to you know then have to do more volume. So the other, you know, the other aspect to really think about is you know, what are the services around the property transaction um, you know, you think about the things that you refer out, be it loans to mortgage brokers, you know, do you have a referral deal on, on the upfronts, main, maintenance referrals for property management, you know, what are those ancillaries that, that you are doing around the transaction that you can, you know, effectively get a clip of the ticket. And there's some of the, the key elements to really focus in on. Um, be strong on your value, be strong on your, you know, your commission rate and your management fee. Um, and, and ensure that you you know you can maintain those margins. Yeah, great, great. All right, so um, the next one we're going to tap into is uh, a lever around volume. So um, looking at, you know, the, I guess if we're looking at increasing the amount of money coming in, you've got both price and volume. Um, and in terms of volume, uh, Matt, what are, the, what are your thoughts around this one? Yeah, look again. It sort of comes back to to what I was just talking about. Um, within um, you know within the marketplace, you, you know revenue comes down to to volume for real estate. You know what is the number of settlements? What are the numbers of, of properties under management? You know we we use those as as key um, performance indicators when we're reporting um, with our businesses. Uh, because that's the thing that you you need to really focus on in terms of lead driving your revenue line. So you know how do you increase volume? I suppose that you know right now it's easily said than done, particularly in the in, in you know respect to the battle for listings. Um, in my view, uh, it's important not to discount your fee. Um, otherwise, yeah, you do need to sell two, three more properties than you you did previously. Um, to get the same level of revenue. So, you know, maintain your fee so that, you know, in terms of the availability of volume, you're capturing as much of that as possible and you're getting the maximum return off that volume. Um, and then again, it's, you know, looking at, at some of those geographic areas, uh, can you tap into to more of those? Now that can be challenging with, particularly with franchise groups that might have restrictions around that. Um, but it's you know it's it's getting into the add-on services, the the finance broking, the ancillary fees that sit around property management. You know, are you charging inspection fees? Those sorts of aspects um, to to try and get as many of the the revenue uh, line items that you can around the property transaction. That's that's the key element. You are the centerpiece to the property transaction. You tend to refer other people in. How are you getting remunerated around that 
one one aspect is your commission, one aspect is your your management fee, but what are the other avenues? And I think also, um, Matt, to your point there, it's it's being able to see those those areas uh, clearly in your financial reporting as well. So how you how you actually display that information within your profit and loss statement, um, you know, in those revenue lines, so you can see what's actually happening and you can use those um, drivers. I know you you do a lot of work on, on structuring um, those financials so that that becomes really clear. But that's if you've got it all in one line item and you can't sort of split it out um, to see the volume or to see the impact um, and to use that in terms of forecasting, um, you know, that, that can sort of be a barrier to be able to, to use this as a lever as well. Um, yeah, so, I, I think that's oh, spot on. Um, you know, the, the key thing there is that um, you need to understand your indicators and, and we do a lot of work with uh, real estate businesses around this, um, you know, understanding that lead process because what you do today impacts the cash flow of two to three months time. Um, and if you're not focused on those activity drivers, you know, the appraisals to list, the list to sell, um, all those sort of aspects, then you're not going to, you're not going to be able to sort of, I suppose, outline what your cash flow will look like in two months time, three months time. It's sort of going to be re relatively unknown. So um, important to understand those things. Yeah, so much of what we do, I think, in, in terms of financial management, it's about getting the right data and then using that data to sort of drive strategy. Um, and this, this is certainly um, quite a key piece around that. All right, the next one we're going to go through is um, around this accounts receivable uh, lever. So this is a, a critical part and because, you know, the flow on effect is out there and, and so many people are being impacted at the moment around cash flow, um, this is an area that really needs a fair bit of attention. So if you're owed money, um, having the right process around that and actually probably dedicating more resources to it to ensure that that money is being collected or you're negotiating with your customers to make sure that um, that money is going to come in uh, is really important. Matt, what are your thoughts around this one? Yeah, look, the accounts receivable thing that we generally see is VPA. Um, and and you know a lot of the time for for an agent to sort of get the listing they might say oh look we'll we'll cover the VPA and and you pay it at settlement um, the problem with that is the business has to fund that advertising uh, right the way through that period um, so you know how do you recover you know vendor paid advertising earlier in the piece now you know that may well be payment plans that may well be yeah, providing a, a discount on that. Um, you yeah, be careful on that. I, I would preface that. Um, but at the same time, look at look at the avenues to get paid up front rather than at settlement. You know, you don't want to be carrying that marketing because what happens when the property doesn't sell? You know, a lot of the times it's hard to recover that um, payment for marketing. So there there are platforms out there that are available in the market. To, for, so that the vendor finances the VPA and you get paid straight away. Um, you know, at times there's fees around that, um, but you know, what's what's the downside? Um, yes, there's a fee, but you get paid straight away. So it's it's really about you trying to get paid first. Um, you know, why should you be taking on your vendor's problem in terms of marketing their property for sale? Um, as I say, it can be challenging to, to do that because there is that negotiation piece, particularly if you're in there against other agents. Um, but, you know, the majority should be trying to, to get paid up front. And I think also um, what I've seen happen sometimes too, Matt, I'm sure you've come across it is, is you know, even that process around, um, you know, making sure that those um, those accounts are being issued and, and invoiced in a timely manner to enable the collection in a in a timely manner. So sometimes, you know, it's easy to um, for your systems to not be as robust and for some of these things to be missed and actually, you know, missing um, sending invoices out around their um, 
you know, the advertising side of things. So, you know, having just taking this time to make sure that you're looking at the systems and processes that you have in place and the timing around um, those systems and processes to make sure that your cash flow is, um, you know, is optimised and, and you, you know, you're not leaving it too long um, to get these things um, out and, and collected. So, yeah, um, it's a great point. Um, Tanya, because like, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a client um, a week ago uh, and we were talking exactly about that piece, the process, because they had um, two to three weeks of VPA that hadn't been invoiced. Um, and I'm sort of sitting there talking about cash flow and saying, well, you need to get that stuff done because, you know, that's impacting you. You're, you've paid for it um, or you're about to pay for it and you haven't even invoiced the client yet. The other thing is, um, is you know the follow-up and, and so on in terms of receivables and, and that you mentioned. Um, you know, unfortunately, with with the systems, you know, CRMs and and so on, they don't always talk to to each other. Um, so you know, we've we've been working with some clients around building um, building reporting around that um, that pulls information out from um, multiple systems and gives them a, one single report. Um, that's that's automated, uh, rather than them having to pull these bits of information out, update a spreadsheet, um, and then try and follow this stuff through. So saving a lot of time doing those things. So it's about trying to automate some of those processes, as you say. Yep, awesome. All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, so we're talking about an assets lever. So ways in which um, you can better utilise assets in your business to improve cash flow. We're seeing some great examples of this, you know, just in business generally about how people are looking at, um, you know, assets that are being underutilised within their business and, you know, turning them into a revenue stream to help themselves get through. Um, so, you know, th this is just kind of a reminder to have a look at the balance sheet. And, you know, if that's something that that um, you overlook and you, you, you don't understand it, so you don't look at it too often, um, which is the case for many businesses, I'll add. Um, it, this is a really good time to sit down and have a look at what assets you do have within the business. How can they be um, potentially better utilised? How could, you know, do you, do you need to sell some assets? Do you need to repurpose them? Um, is refinancing an option? So just looking at the balance sheet, um, often, you know, that's the starting point to really trying to, um, you know, fix a lot of cash flow issues because it, a lot of it is contained and held within your balance sheet. Um, and so, so understanding it, um, taking some time to talk to your accountant, talk to your advisors and actually get a clear picture on, on that balance sheet, understand it will be a, a key lever to you freeing up cash flow. Any further thoughts on that one, Matt? Yeah, sort of, um, you know, as we talk about profit doesn't always equal cash and balance sheet is a, a significant player in the cash flow um, timeframes and, and uh, you know, things like the, the liabilities, you know, GST and all those sorts of aspects. So it is important that, um, you know, the balance sheet is reviewed, um, the impact on what that means for cash flow, uh, and uh, you know, critical that that comes into the cash flow thinking. Yep, awesome. Now, next one we've got is uh, a commission lever. This is one that is very much um, specific to your industry, and um, and we've called it the commission lever. Uh, and I'm going to get Matt to take you through this and give you his thoughts on this one. Yeah, look, this is probably one of the big ones um, in terms of uh, the impacts on cash flow. Um, just the, the timing of, of commissions, uh, you know, generally speaking, you, you'll see some delay you'll, for, for whatever reason, something doesn't settle tomorrow, um, it gets pushed by a couple of days, um, might even get pushed to the following week, things like that. So, you know, um, that has a significant impact on cash flow. Um, the other thing is is around, I suppose, this this um, settlement day. So once once the contract's signed and and obviously the time to settle, how do you, how can you reduce that um, as much as possible? So you're not having to sign contracts that are 60 days, etc. You can try and sort of limit that time frame from when it goes to contract to to when it settles. Um, you know, what are the processes that 
and, and systems that you need to have in place to try and streamline that as much as possible, knowing that the banks are harder to deal with um, what is it in that process in the finance approval process that you can streamline so that you can reduce it even if it's from a 60 day settlement down to a 45 day settlement that 15 days can make all the difference in terms of your cash flow so really important to think that whole process through um, where are the bits that you can influence and um, implement change to your process to streamline it um, even the things around you know commission payouts to to <clears throat> to agents um, you know what's the time frame around that now you know we're sort of seeing <clears throat> excuse me um, we're seeing things around JobKeeper um, and and I suppose the the flow on impacts of you know, co commission only agents not having anything in a given fortnight so. What is it that um, you need to do around that to ensure that you know as much cash is retained to the business? Um, and we have sort of seen um, businesses change from being monthly payment of, of commission uh, settlements out to agents back to fortnightly, so that you know assists with the job keeper retention. Um, rather than sort of losing some of that from the business as well. So important to understand all those things, um, important to work on the process um, so that you can try and streamline the settlements as best as you can. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, next one is uh, in relation to staff. So looking at your staffing lever, um, obviously, you know, this is a big part of, um, you know, the, the costs of your business. And so looking at the utilisation and productivity, um, looking at the staffing levels, um, you know, you've got access to JobKeeper um, at the moment. There's also the PAYG cash boost. Uh, what does that all look like and, and how do you need to change the staffing mix um, in order to ensure that your cash flow can sort of stretch through and you don't lose key people. So, you know, typically I'd say staffing's the last one that you really want to impact because it has such a such a flow on effect to your business strategy. It's a really good time to think about, you know, have you got the right people on the team? Are they all the people that you want to keep on the team? And and to make sure that um, you know, strategically, you're setting yourself up to to retain good people even through this um, difficult period. So, um, in terms of staffing, you know, I'm sure that's one that, that's probably um, front of mind for everyone at the moment. But any further thoughts around that one from you, Matt? Yeah, I think the point you make around um, retaining um, staff is is a good one. Um, and look, JobKeeper has been, uh, I suppose, a blessing uh, in many respects for, for that. Um, because it's not about necessarily uh, the here and now, it's about, you know, two months time, three months time when when we st sort of start to see, you know, an uptick in, in um, things on the market, an uptick in, in transactions. Uh, you know, you want the right staff at that time so that you can come out and absolutely fly in the market and get you know get the sort of transactions that you expect as a team so really important that yeah you do think that through you retain the good ones um, but you know more importantly as well uh, ensuring that you you have looked at that mix and and is it appropriate for the business model going forward um, and you know that may well require tough decisions uh, but but it's a it's around what's the right thing for the business model um, so yeah uh, thoughts on both sides of that. Yep, great. All right, so um, just some additional strategies. So that's all the sort of levers that we talk about in terms of cash flow and, and the strategic elements of what you can do, um, you know, on top of sort of having that, having the information, having the forecast in place, but then what are the strategic pieces that you pull into it? Um, just some further strategies that you can look at um, in this current period of time. So um, we have the, um, you know, standstill arrangements, which is essentially just um, some negotiated payment holidays with some of your creditors. So actually having those conversations to look at how you can um, defer. Now this is, this is a mechanism which is around deferral um, of your cash flow. So it's not going to, um, it's not going to solve things in the, in the longer term, but it might give you that relief that you need to sort of get your cash flow to stretch through that little bit further. 
the, the issue that I suppose you need to be aware of um, with these is you don't want to create um, a bigger problem at the other end. So you don't want to take up all of, all of these deferral options that might be out there at the moment and then end up in a situation at the end where, um, you know, essentially you um, you have more debt than, than what you can handle and, and that becomes the bigger problem. So um, these are things that are available, but certainly um, be very aware of what the impact is and what the liability is that you're creating. Um, but a really good um, opportunity if, if you can have some discussions and it's about being upfront, being um, transparent um, and, you know, trying to negotiate a plan to get through because everyone is in, you know, this, this unusual and, um, you know, common situation at the moment where this is quite a, um, you know, something that's happening on a regular basis. People are having these conversations. So it's better to get in, be upfront um, and see what you can organise there. Um, we also have um, other sources of capital. So if you're looking at your cash flow, and this is where it becomes really clear um, when you've got a good cash flow forecast in place to understand where your cash flow gaps are, when you're going to run out of money, um, if that is the case, how much funding you might need, and then um, being being open about you know looking at different funding options. The banks are fairly supportive at the moment. Um, they're also um, allowing some deferrals of payments. So each bank is quite different. We have some some great information available um, around what all the banks are doing and what are the options um, you know that you can uh, take up at the moment but again you know most of this is is kind of deferral um, and and taking on additional um, debt in the business there's some great opportunities through some of the stimulus package to do that but you know making sure that you can um, accommodate that debt and you're not creating you know, a, I guess a bigger problem down the track. Um, they're the things that you really need to um, be aware of. If you do have other business partners, then perhaps looking at some equity sources to so getting um, people to contribute money in um, to help sort of boost that cash flow through this period is certainly um, an opportunity. Um, some other things uh, in terms of stimulus, there's plenty of stimulus out there at the moment. I'm sure that everyone is um, across many of these, but key ones, Matt, that um, you know, you're know you sort of dealing with from a real estate industry point of view. Do you want to just quickly touch on those? Yeah, so obviously the, the pay as you go um, with holding cash flow boost, um, you know, obviously most people are getting access to that. Um, the JobKeeper side of things, uh, it is interesting um, with that, like we've had a number of clients uh, be able to, to get access to that, a number don't yet qualify or, you know, are finding it difficult to qualify, particularly with property management in the business uh, because property management hasn't necessarily dropped off as much as sales. Um, but, they, you know, we've also had uh, to look at the alternate rules for a number of, of clients that had restructured um, and been able to get them in. We've also looked at the alternate rules around uh, businesses that have grown, so where they've acquired rent rolls and or had some significant organic growth but then seen a drop off. Um, so we've been looking at those tests. Um, so, you know, trying to get hold of that. Um, you know, in SA we've got the the ten thousand dollar grant for for SMEs, um, where you know they haven't had the eligibility for payroll tax uh, relief. Um, so looking at those things, um, we've had a few clients that have been able to get access to that. So it's it's trying to understand all those aspects and then working that into your cash flow uh, forecast to understand again what what that's doing on a week to week, month to month basis. And yeah, I think that's really, that's, you know, one of the most difficult things is that there's so many of these elements and how they all come together and the timing of when they land and what does that mean and, you know, where's the cash flow gaps. So there's, there's sort of short term funding in between when some of these pieces are landing um, into your bank accounts and, and you know, as, as funding support. So um, it's why at the moment it's really important, you know, I can't stress enough that if you're trying to do the mechanics of, of calculating cash flow in your head or if you're just living day by day in terms of what's in the bank account, um, it's not the smart way to do it. And you can, you can actually um, put some strategy behind cash flow and stretch it out quite a bit further. So just being able to have that sort of look forward um, 
situation where you can sort of predict out, you can build in some what if scenarios, it, it's a really critical piece at the time. And I think it just gives everyone a little bit of sanity as well um, to be able to navigate, you know, this period. Just a just few- Just simply um, the, you know, the, Tanya, just um, on the JobKeeper, like just the timing of your declaration each month um, can be the difference between whether you receive it this week or next week. Yeah, um, and, and, and one we week in a cash flow. Yeah, one week in a cash flow can mean, you know, the difference between cash flow positive or cash flow negative. So, um, it, it, you know, it's fascinating when you start sort of looking at these, the cash flow modelling piece. Sometimes it's just moving things by one week that makes all the difference. So, um, understanding that it just gives you such great control over your business. Um, and it's not hard. It's just you've got to put the time into building all of the pieces first. Um, but from, you know, from a maintenance point of view, it's really quite straightforward. Forward. Okay, so a few things to remember. Um, you know, whilst we're talking about cash flow today, cash flow is one element of your financial um, position and financial management. Um, so, you know, whilst it's important, it shouldn't be the only focus. So, you know, you do have your um, profit and loss and, and your forecasting around a budget um, that you should have in place. And as much as that is difficult, um, you know, to try and predict uh, it's not impossible uh, and you should still have those targets in place and, and be updating them and refining them as more information is coming to hand. Your balance sheet is the other element. So we, we have cash flow, we have profit and loss and we have a balance sheet and all those three elements work together to give you the overall um, understanding of your financial position um, and you know one in isolation, any one of those in isolation will give you a, a false view of of where things are at. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, whilst cash flow is important, keep keep the bigger picture of all of those pieces in mind. Um, keep assessing your plan as you go. So the the impact. Um, in terms of understanding, you know, what the actions that you're taking now, what the impact is going to be on the future. So that that's continually evolving. And so you, these are pieces that are living, you know, daily in your business that you're having to sort of work with to to kind of keep to try and keep getting that prediction of, of where you're heading um, as accurate as possible. So um, keep keep up to date with that and try to avoid collecting liabilities along the way. So that that to me would be the last thing that you want to do um, is to kind of take on more debt um, if you can avoid it. Look at how you can stretch your cash flow without actually committing to additional liabilities, deferral mechanisms or, or collecting liabilities um, along the way because that's that's just creating a bigger problem for you down the track. Um, it's definitely there as an option, you can do it, but you need to manage it so that it doesn't become that bigger problem um, as we go forward. Uh, in terms of um, your role as, as a company director, just touching on this, there was, um, <coughs> excuse me, some um, legislation that was announced in terms of um, a moratorium in, on insolvent trading, so your director obligations. There was a six month sort of um, period there that's that's been, um, you know, noted in a lot of the information that's been coming out. But just be aware that um, in, a, in a company situation as a company director, you still have obligations um, that extend beyond that. So um, it is important that you do keep your financial records up to date um, and that you are acting in good faith and that you're doing everything that you need to as in terms of your company director obligations. Um, and, you know, the, the insolvent trading piece is only one piece of your obligations there that, that they're doing a carve out around. So whilst that's helpful, it might sort of um, help you sleep at night a little bit more if the debts are mounting. Um, it certainly is is not, you know, the um, it's not a, a catch all piece. Um, you need to be aware that there are, are other elements there that you, um, you still need to abide by. <clears throat> Okay, and um, just in terms of being proactive, I suppose, um, you know, when you're looking at all of the options that are available to you, um, it's it's really, um, I'm finding people are, because everyone's in the same boat, which is really unusual, um, people are really uh, trying to work together, um, make things, you know, make sure that they're accommodating um, conversations with suppliers are, 
um, certainly a lot more positive than they would be if we weren't in this situation. Um, but if you know you're having those negotiations um, and you you had a go at, at uh, putting some negotiations in place they haven't worked out um, you know round two go back again um, see what might come up now but just keep these conversations alive and the best thing you can do is is be up front and make sure that um, you know you don't just bury your head and hope it's going to go away that's probably the worst thing you can do you need to keep your lodgements up to date with the ATO um, you need to make sure that you're being proactive in all ways and just um, being open and transparent in terms of the situation you're in and that that will stand you in good stead for a lot of these negotiations um, and you know also mentioning there that um, you know business model innovation I'm seeing some great things happening um, around the place in terms of innovation and certainly you know I think there's great opportunities in in uh, the real estate space and I guess Matt you know keen to keen to just um, tap into some of the things that you might be seeing out there in terms of um, you know any any innovative um, approaches that people are taking in the real estate game at the moment. Yeah I, I think it, it you know comes back to my earlier point uh, around um, looking at the property transaction um, and I suppose you know getting a clip of the ticket on on all those aspects that you're referring out. Um, we've also sort of seen um, businesses that have looked at uh, rather than sort of outsourcing maintenance for property management actually go and employ someone um, so that you know they can control that maintenance a lot better um, and but also probably get the the value uplift. We've seen, you know, uh, a lot of outsourcing um, that's occurred in in the whole process piece, um, which has enabled them to to save cost in that space. Um, but it's it's really just trying to to build those revenue streams around the property transaction, uh, and and get as much of that as you possibly can, and then you know, be as lean as possible, look at the technology um, aspects and build automation into the business um, and, and be lean. Yeah. And, you know, just, there's so much great technology out there and now's a really good time to kind of really refine systems and, you know, do all the things potentially that, um, you know, you would have liked to have been doing over the years but never had the time to do. So um, I've seen a lot of great instances of businesses doing that around the place as well. All right, so um, just wanting to take you through um, a couple of uh, options in terms of next steps. And um, if you if you feel that a cash flow forecast would really help you, um, then we do have some options in terms of assisting you to do that. Um, we have a um, cash flow management workshop. So it's a virtual workshop uh, which we conduct and we uh, work with you. Um, and this is specifically for um, real estate professionals. So um, in, in a um, workshop scenario, uh, giving you a tool which you take away and can use forever um, and teach you how to build it. So in the space of a workshop and um, we allocate as much time as you need but uh, typically we can get through these workshops fairly quickly um, and if you bring if you have all the information with you to build it out you can do um, within a few hours so um, this is a great opportunity to spend some time build this model out um, walk away with a, a cash flow forecast which is going to be accurate um, it's collaborative and you can also um, then get some accuracy and, and sort of clarity around what the next 12 weeks and beyond look like um, the tool that we work through is one that we've built specifically and it takes you through this process of really um, breaking down your cash flow into separate tabs um, so that you can easily get to the parts that you need to when you need to um, make changes. So we start by going through and working out what bank accounts and how you're going to structure it. Do you want to take a consolidated view? Do you want to take um, a business unit view? Um, there's lots of different ways. So this is a fully customizable piece that we kind of work through with you and, and ensure that um, you know you have you walk away with a ready um, built cash flow forecast that is up, up and working. Um, we also take through take you through looking at the recurring cash inflow. So in your instance, um, you're going to have property management um, income that's going to come through on a regular basis. So mapping that out, putting the dates in, and as you can see, when you put dates in, it flows into the relevant weeks of your cash flow. So it becomes quite clear um, and easy to move things around as well if things change. Um, we then go through and model the variable cash 
coming in. So these are the things that are less predictable and um, you can use this to track and to look at how this money is going to flow in and, and how the changes um, may need to be adapted. And, and simply by changing a date will help it pull into the right week of your cash flow. We walk through their cash going out and uh, in terms of uh, cash that's moving out of the business, they're going to be those automatic things that are coming out on a certain date, but there's also going to be things which are coming out on a variable um, nature. So you have control over when the information, oh, sorry, when the uh, payment comes out of your bank account. And that's a great lever to have because um, you can negotiate arrangements, you can do payment plans, you can push it out by one week and see what the impact then is on your cash flow. Um, we also break down the tax and superannuation into a separate tab. And I think over the years, I've had many clients that just, just want to see all of their tax and super and the, those lumpy commitments all in one place. Um, and so this is great because you can, you can pretty much map out for the next 12 months what that looks like, um, factor it in and just update it as relevant information comes to hand. We've also built in the uh, cash boost calculators. So we take you through and um, build this out so that you are clear on the cash flow uh, timing for the cash boost. Um, and this is all automated. So you just have to say whether you're monthly or quarterly, what the reportable amount for March was, and it brings this in um, to offset against your tax. Wages are also scheduled in, so we build this out piece by piece. It might seem like there's a lot there that we're building out, but um, essentially we, we get our advisors to work with you, build this out. You don't share any information with anyone except yourself, um, and, and we just guide you in how you build this out um, over the course of the workshop. The JobKeeper subsidy is also in there. So once we um, establish which employees are eligible and that your business is eligible, factoring those in and getting the timing of those payments into your cash flow is critical um, and working out if you have any top up payments. So it deals with all of that. And it all culminates into this final um, cash flow forecast, which is 52 weeks and beyond. So um, ideally we like people to come into the um, cash flow uh, workshop and um, bring all of the information together and walk away with a 12 month cash flow forecast, which is essentially setting the model and you can update it as you go. So this is a really um, a hands-on workshop where we'll guide you through, help you build this embedded in your business um, and you take away this tool and it's yours to use um, and to do with what you want, but we'll help you customize and build it to give you that clarity around your cash flow going forward. And it's such a critical element um, you know, for business to just get their minds around. So if you are interested in, um, in that particular workshop, we'll have some further information coming out to you post this webinar, um, but that workshop is coming up and we'll be working with our, um, our team and people that are actually uh, familiar with uh, your industry and will help you build it out um, in an industry specific tool uh, that will give you much more clarity around your cash flow and help you navigate this time. So uh, that's everything that we have to go through with you today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Any final comments from you today, Matt? Uh, so yeah, look, mainly, uh, you know, my view is that every business needs to have this in built in in their business. Um, you know, we we talk about cash flow as the the centerpiece of everything um, when we talk to our businesses. Um, you know, this this sort of uh, lays it out very very simply. You know, there's a lot of levers that you can play around with to to make it all work for you. Um, but this this gives you a, a really good snapshot of of uh, what the the business cash flow looks like and how you can chop and change it to to you know navigate through the tough times and and come out the other side and and prosper. So, um, Tanya, really thank you for for your contribution today and um, yeah, most appreciative. Great, thank you very much. So just, um, just a reminder, the date um, for that workshop is the 21st of May. Um, it's $395 for the workshop. You get the tool, you get the time with the advisors, we help you build it, you walk away with a fully built cash flow. Um, and you know, we would certainly love to help you get that piece in place. If you don't have um, a cash flow tool like that, um, 
certainly look at putting this in place. Uh, we've been doing this with a lot of businesses just to really help them get that clarity um, and to, to see and, and be more strategic about their cash flow forecasting going forward. So thank you very much everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Matt, for your contribution um, and no all the best everyone going forward. Thank you.